Um, next question, the other part of it is how much do I need to reinvest if I want to pay no taxes, which is um, a common thing. This is an area where most people have it wrong. They have to, how much do you have to invest? Everything. It's not the profit, it's not the equity. You have to reinvest equal or greater to what you sell the property for if you want to defer all your taxes. So if you're selling the property for a million dollars, you need to buy for at least a million dollars. I don't care what you bought it for. I don't care how much money you spent fixing it up. I don't really even care what your loan is on the property. If you sell for a million, you need to buy for at least a million. Now, can you buy for more than a million? Yes, you could buy for 5 million, 10 million. Can you buy multiple properties? Absolutely, you can buy three, or I did an exchange once for a woman who bought 18 houses. Um, obviously not locally, but um, so, so the, the equal or greater part is very important. Now, can you sell for a million but buy for 900,000? The answer is yes, you can, but you're gonna pay tax on that difference. That difference is referred to as boot. Boot is what you pay tax on. So can you buy for less? Yes, but if you do, you're gonna pay tax on whatever that delta is. As a rule, if you don't wanna pay taxes, equal or greater. The second part to that is all of the equity. All the cash from the sale has to go into the new property. Any cash left over, you pay taxes on. So the key here is don't get too big of a loan. I had a client recently sold her house in San Mateo and bought a shopping center. And for some reason, her and her lender got, got crosswise and the lender gave her too big of a loan. And even though she bought a property that was more expensive, the loan was too big, she had cash left over. She had to pay tax on that cash. So, um, so the other part of it, which is kind of falls in line with that is the debt. There's, there are a lot of people who get really worried that you have to get another loan on the property. That's not technically correct. If you sell a million dollar property and you had a $200,000 loan, you still need to buy a million dollar property and that $800,000 is still gonna go as a down payment you do need to make up that $200,000 difference somehow. For most people, yes, they're gonna get another loan to replace the loan that they had. But if you have cash in your pocket, you're welcome to use that as well, or seller financing, or some other way that you can make up to make up that debt. So don't worry about replacing debt with other debt. It's just replacing the value of that debt when you buy the new property so you get to the equal or greater. So again, anything you receive, you are paying taxes on. The easiest way to think about this, I call it the, the thumbnail test. Did you buy something equal or greater in value? And did you use equal or more of the equity? As long as both those two criteria are met, you are deferring all of your taxes. Now, let, now I'm gonna change gears a little bit. So right now we've basically talked about the mechanics of the 1031. And in reality is that's the majority of it. Now, you're selling something, you're buying something, you have a very strict timeline. You got to reinvest all the money. You got to buy investment real estate. But for the most part, it's a fairly simple process. So now I'm going to kind of go more into why people do exchange. If I ask you why you do exchange, most people will think off the top of their head, well, I'm on deferred taxes. The reality is the easiest way to defer taxes is don't sell it. Right? The, way, the way I look at it is the reason you do exchanges is because you want to buy something better than what you own today. Now, what does better mean? Better means whatever the hell you want it to mean. It could be I want to diversify. It could be I want to consolidate. It can, it can be I'm moving to Arizona, so I'm moving my rentals to Arizona. It could be I want better property with better cash flow. Maybe it's property I ran out of depreciation, so now I need a new depreciation stream. Um, maybe it's something that you want your kids to live in and they're going to charge them rent. So you're going to, I did an exchange last year for a gentleman who, who sold a property. So he could do an exchange into an area where his grandkids could go to a better school district, as long as he was treating his daughter like a regular tenant, perfectly okay to do. Um, I've even done 10 to one exchanges for people who were looking to this as an estate planning tool. Basically, they didn't want the kids to fight over their one really nice property, so they did exchanges into multiple properties that each kid knew what they were going to inherit. And there was no fighting uh, at that time. So. The key here is you do exchanges to buy something that makes more sense for you tomorrow than what you own today. And when you think about it that way, 1031 is an amazing tool, okay? Most of us have assets. 
we own stocks, we own bonds, we have art collections, we have whatever, not all of us do, but I mean, many of us do. And the problem with any of those assets is whenever you sell them, any profit you make, you gotta pay taxes. If you sell a stock or mutual fund and you made money, you gotta pay taxes, even if you're gonna go buy another one the same day. With real estate, we have this fantastic thing that is not available in any other asset class. You can sell investment real estate and buy other investment real estate and not have to pay the tax man every single time. So think of 1031 a way more as a way to reposition your money from what you own today to what you want to own tomorrow. If you think about it that way, 1031 is an amazing tool. All right. Now, one of the areas we I will often talk to people about is people who are at or past retirement age and they're looking to simplify their life. They're tired of owning real estate. They want what we would term an exit strategy. So what are some of the exit strategies that you can think about if you are looking to, 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 you know, to get out of actively managing your real estate? No, well, number one, always pay the taxes. Not really popular in my book, but for a lot of people, that's still the, the easiest way out. Dying, again, dying is a great tax strategy. I don't recommend it proactively though, uh, but if for some people it's, you know, it's the easiest, is the way to get out and not have to pay the taxes. Um, seller financing. I think seller financing is a vastly underutilized tool. Now, seller financing and 1031 do not mix, but if you're, if you're just going to cash out, my father is the best example of this. When my father was 65, um, he was in, in, in an accident that forced him to retire. After a few months of retirement, he says, I'm sick of my real estate. I want to travel. I want to see my grandkids. I'm, he's a very hands-on person, 91 years old, still, you know, very active. Um, but the reality is he was sick of real estate. He, he wanted out. He, he wanted to get rid of it. So what did he do? He acted like the bank. He did seller financing. And for 20 years, he got payments from the guy who bought the property from him. And that's a great tax strategy because it gave him cash flow and it extended out his tax obligation for 20 years. So I think seller financing is a really nice way to get out um, if you want to cash out. So this is just a solution that's out there. Um, and this is my favorite. Do an exchange into the house that ultimately you're going to move into and retire. Now, my goal, I have three crappy little rentals. I'm going to sell them and buy a condo in Hawaii. Okay, so what am I going to do? I, though I'm going to rent, the, rent out that Hawaii property for a few years first. But when I'm ready to retire, goodbye Bay Area, hello Hawaii, and by moving into that property, I, I, there, is no tax, there is no tax obligation. You do need to rent it for at least a few years before you do it, but and if I ever sell the property, then I'm going to have a tax issue. So the takeaway for that is if you have a property that uh, you basically you want to move into it, live in it for two years and selling it, not a good tax strategy. Buy a property that you're going to retire into and live there theoretically the rest of your life. Great tax strategy. So um, that's one I, I think is one I'm seeing a lot of people do, basically. Um, estate planning. Again, this is where you're buying real estate that you know what your kids or grandkids are going to inherit. That way there's no fighting and everyone knows exactly what they're going to get in. Um, lastly, the, you could you could exchange into what I refer to as low maintenance assets. The last one on there is pretty common. It's referred to as triple net or net lease real estate. That's where you're buying a Starbucks. You're buying a Jiffy Lube. You're buying a Walgreens. You're buying not the business, but you're buying the building and leasing it to the corporation or franchisee who then pays you 10, 20, 30, 50 year leases. I've even seen government buildings, post offices, um, DMVs. I've seen uh, university buildings. Um, and essentially, you don't have to manage it because the term triple net refers to the fact that the tenant pays the taxes, pays the insurance, and does all the maintenance. Very, ni uh, very nice. And typically, you know exactly how much you're going to be getting for the term of the lease. The problem is I don't want a Walgreens. I want a Walmart. The Walmarts are $50 million, and I don't have $50 million. So what am I going to do? I'm going to buy a piece of the Walmart. There are companies out there. Uh, the TIC structure is what used to be. Now most of them are under the Delaware Statutory Trust structure. 
And what you have here are companies who go out and buy that Walmart or buy a 200 unit apartment building or buy a, um, a major shopping center and they sell it to you in fractions. So you can buy stuff in, with as little as $100,000 and the key is they maintain it, they manage it and you get the, the cash flow from the property. This is not a REIT. A REIT does not qualify for 1031. But a DST does because in a DST, you have individual ownership in specific real estate. So that is something that a lot of people explore. Um, they are not for everybody uh, because you have no control over the asset. Uh, typically, the properties are sold every four to seven years. So it's not very liquid on your part. Um, but it does work for a lot of people because it's predictable, it's predictable cash flow and it's, it meets the criteria of low management and, and I still get to defer my taxes. So, you know, again, these are just some of the strategies that you can think about when it comes to, you know, it, cashing out if that's where you are in your, in your, uh, in your life. But other than that, I am now open to questions. Jean. Thank you so much, Ron. And um, I would just kind of backing up into the Delaware Statutory Trust. Um, I've been to, but we had one seminar on it, but people who, uh, we, they also tout themselves as a third alternative because you need to identify three properties. And you, if you identify maybe a, De a Delaware Statutory Trust, as your third one, that can be the fallback just in case yes. the other two don't work out. So I've seen that as well. Um, uh, also, people will use it as a filler. I had a client recently who sold his property for a million three. He was going to buy something for a million. Didn't realize he needed to spend all three of all million three. So he put the other 300 into a DST just to get to that equal or greater point. Okay. And would you recommend 1031 for someone who's maybe going to buy a property? They'll only hold on to maybe five years or 10 years. It's still deferred. So is that a good uh, again, you know, we can't predict the future. And if price, you know, if we have a repeat of 2008, then obviously, you know, things are, are going to, uh, you know, it's not worth holding some property, property for five years. But the way I look at it, I mean, if I could push out paying that tax man for five years, why not do it? To me, it's, it's like getting an interest free, no payment loan from the government. It's a good way to think of it. Are there any questions from anyone? If you do, you can go ahead and unmute yourself, I think. We have enough people we can manage that. I didn't actually have a question, but just a comment. Sure. Chris. So we've been talking about you know selling and 1031 exchanges and stuff. And we got into rental property. I uh, just want to let everybody know the, the rental property that we own with the pandemic and everything, mm -hmm. everybody's paying their rent. Nobody's asking for deferment. And it's all good. Mm -hmm. We got good tenants because we don't charge total market rates, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's a good strategy, you know, if you can do it. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to our current house, personal residence on. We are renting it out. We'll do it for up to, you know, two years, maybe a little bit more. Then we'll be able to do a 1031 exchange on it, mm -hmm. plus the Section 121 yep. permit. So we'll sell it for whatever, mm -hmm. take the 500 and 1031 the rest. Or if we sell it, do we have to 1031 the full sales price? No, you get to keep the 500. So you, is the sales price minus the 500, that'd be your, that's your bogey uh, because you got to keep the other 500 from the gain, from the gain tax free. Perfect. That's exactly what we want to do. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be talking to you soon, man, I'm sure. Yeah, cut it all <laughs> under control. And and again, it's that only that's the only thing that you could subtract from that from that uh, the post the Correct. sale price is that homeowner exemption if you have that. Right. Now one thing I'll just a side note, when we're talking about sales price, how much to reinvest, technically you can subtract realtor fees and escrow fees, but you know, so to make it simple focus on equal or greater and we could worry about the nickel and dime stuff when we get to it. Sure, that's a detail. Also, um, you did mention uh, depreciation recapture is also abated at, you know, like it's inherited. So that's good to know too. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Any other? Great presentation. Eric, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? You're too clear. Our, um, one question, are they generally the same in Florida? 
Uh, yes, these rules are national. So that's, that's a very good point. Um, because, you, because you can exchange anywhere in the country, the rules are national and can be and work anywhere. And even if you sell in California, buy in Florida, you are deferring both state and federal taxes. Now, I will say the state of California does have you file annual tax reports, making sure that you haven't sold your property in Florida, because if you ever do sell your property in Florida, California wants to get their share of the taxes from the no. in California. Mm -hmm. So that is repeat? something. Hmm. Can you repeat that? that? Okay. Most states have this, okay? You made money in their state, you did a 1031 exchange somewhere else. Mm -hmm. If you ever sell that property, the, the original states wants their, wants taxes based on how much profit you deferred from their, the, month, the property in yeah. their state. California has that as well. So if you sell their property in California, buy something in Florida, in three years from now you sell that property in Florida, well, most of the gain in that Florida property came from California, so California wants their share of the taxes. Um, and so because of this, you have to annually file to the state of California. Yes, I still own that Oregon property. Yes, I still own that Florida property. Because if you ever stop, they're going to assume you sold the property and hit you with the tax bill. But what if you're doing multiple exchange? Like if you've exchanged that property for another? As you long as you keep reporting, I'm still exchanging. I don't, I'm not realizing my gain. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I don't have to pay the taxes. You just keep filing that and you're okay. I see. Okay. Um, I think Gary unmuted yourself. Did you have a question, Gary? Okay. The wonderful presentation. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, death is probably the best tax advantage we have. <laughs> probably the only good thing you can get out of it. <laughs> That's why you see so many rentals up here in Millbrae. <laughs> People are in old folks' homes and Heirs are waiting till they pass. You know what can I say? <laughs> but no, it, it's good. I, I just I found it quite interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. No. Okay. Well, um, and we do have you do see uh, Ron's information on the screen. So if you have any yes. questions, oh, one thing I would add is if you're planning to do a 1031, let your real estate agents know on both ends. So we had one situation this past year where uh, a client had sold their property already in Hawaii and the clock started ticking and then now they're, they're coming over and they didn't say right away before they started looking that they were in a 1031 situation. So I think it's really important because of that timeline, make sure that your agents are aware on both sides, uh, wherever you are, whether you're buying in California or selling in Florida, um, whatever, or selling in California, buying in Florida, it's really important to let people know that from the beginning. So I think that's super important because the timelines can mess you up uh, and we want to make sure that's done. I have, I see a question of, uh, if you can go back to maybe that slide, I'll go back to that slide. Uh, uh, I, I, I saw the question about the 180 yeah. days. Mm -hmm. I'll pull up yeah, that the, timeline. The, 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 the key there is, you have 45 days to identify what you're going to buy. Hunt back, go back. Yep. I'm still. 180 days to actually close the escrow. So the the key here is that unless you're buying new construction, that 180 day is probably not going to be an issue. Uh, but you but uh, is is it, it's not always 180 days. It is always 180 days. I think what you may be thinking about is. If you sell your property late in the year and you're going to the next, if you're going into the following year, you do every, um, so let's say you sold your property December of 2020 and you buy your replacement in 2021. Everything is still shown on your 2020 tax return. So if come April 15th, you still haven't bought your property, you'll need to file for an extension so that you're able to finish your exchange before you file your tax return but you still get your full 180 days, even if you cross over calendar years. And uh, there's a question about if you move from California and bought your goal retirement property, then um, I must, you would not have to pay tax. So I'm assuming you ex somebody exchanged into an investment uh, that's eventual goal retirement and then moved into it. Uh, that there's no tax due when you move in. There's only tax due should, if and when you sell the property. When you sell that property okay i hope that answered the question 
It's not and if you have more questions afterwards, you feel free to call or email me anything follow up. Just one quick question, Ron. If yeah. if this 180 days is is exceeded, not because of a fault of the of the person who's trying to uh, complete the transaction, but the buyer of the new property, if something happens to their credit, their loan, you know, and it's not your fault, <laughs> it's someone else's fault. That doesn't mm -hmm. help. Yeah. Doesn't matter whose fault it is. Doesn't matter whose fault it is. I get this all the time. Um, developers are you know, buying, filling property. Oh yeah, we'll be done by February, and there are days, there are 180 days in April, and they're sweating it out to the last day. If it's the, if it's a day late, the whole thing falls apart. IRS has no sympathy for whose fault it is. Okay. <laughs> and that might be why you'd want to have something like a, a DST, the Delaware Statute, yeah. just as a fallback, because then just in case something happens, you don't lose that. Yeah, you, that days. probably won't work for the 180 days, because by the time you get to day 180, your those DSTs will be all gone, probably. That's but, probably um, true, but at but, least you know ahead of time. Yeah, a little bit extra time, yes. Yeah, if, it, if it's not. Um, any other questions? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, wrap this up. So please, uh, thank you so much, Ron. He's, uh, I learn something every single time uh, you speak for us and I look forward to having you come back again. And thank you for that information, um, for your presentation.